Ubisutter.live's local government live streams are presented by Plumas Lake Self Storage in Plumas Lake, where lifelong local residents are helping other residents keep things safe, providing indoor storage units, outdoor RV and vehicle parking, moving supplies, and Penske truck rentals. Details at PlumasLakeSelfStorage.com. Skip's Marysville Music Cafe, with lessons in person and personalized. Instruments, including guitars and amps, horns, strings, strings for instruments, and a myriad of music and sound equipment. Skip's Marysville Music Cafe. EH-22-23-25, EH-22-23-28, and that's 25 through 28. And reinstatement, EH-21-23-35. And then at tonight's board meeting, suspended expulsion contracts. EH 2223 29 through EH 2223 31 and EH 2223 34 through EH 2223 39. And we had reinstatements EH 18 19 5 EH 19 20 40 EH 22 22 08 through EH 21 22 10. Then EH 21 22 15 EH 21 22 18 through EH 21 EH 2123-31, EH 2122-37, EH 2122-48 through EH 2122-47, EH 2122-68, EH 2122-73, EH 2122-75 and EH 2122-76 through EH 21-22-17, 77. The board confirmed the superintendent's recommendation to appoint Karen Dow as principal of Koroa and Browns Valley effective January 3, 2023. Thank you, Dr. Azrani, for your confidence in me.
I'm looking forward to continuing the standards of excellence at both Browns Valley Elementary and Cordoba Elementary. Thank you to the board for allowing me this tremendous opportunity. I would like to thank my Ella family, the teachers, support staff, students, and community. Ella has been my home for the past three and a half years, and it was an honor to work with and learn from all of them. I would also like to thank Principal Jennifer McAdam, whose mentorship and guidance has been instrumental in my development and growth as a leader. I feel very blessed to continue to serve this district in a new capacity. I'm excited to begin working in the Browns Valley and Hallwood communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one last item that we covered in closed session, the board acted unanimously to begin termination proceedings against a district certified staff member. The board also authorized the district to place the employee into unpaid leave status. Now we have recognition. Go down and yeah. so come down. All right, thank you. Before we begin with the official program for tonight's recognition, can we just give the wonderful musicians, under the guidance of David Aredia, our uh, director? from Marysville High School some appreciation for the wonderful tunes they did for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So tonight we're going to begin our uh, presentations with the California School Boards Association Golden Bell Award which was going to be presented to uh, the Marysville Charter Academy for the Arts under the principal, Mr. Uh, James Lohman, and his wonderful math teachers. The award is for the math department who has, re who has uh, showed some tremendous math achievement and some tremendous math instruction. So we would like to just honor these folks tonight and ask you please to come up and receive your certificates and also to shake hands with the board and uh, take some pictures. Thank you. Can we give them a round of applause, please? There you go, Mr. Valentini. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations once again. We also want to recognize uh, outstanding student achievement, leadership, and athletics performance from Marysville High School. First, uh, I'd like to ask the principal to come on up. Mr. V, come on up on behalf of your school. Congratulations. And this is for student, and I don't believe the student is here, but David Canovalchek and for Jessica Conway. David is a, uh, receiving a reward for his performance under the FFA banner, and Ms. Conway is receiving it for having received or signed a letter, um, pardon me, a uh, scholarship for softball. So thank you to these two outstanding students.
And uh, please allow me to make a correction. It was Janisa Conway, not Jessica. So I apologize to Janisa. Janisa. Also, as a board knows and the audience should know, that we recognize uh, every month outstanding performance from both students and staff. And we also are doing that this evening. So for uh, December, we have several students who are in attendance. We want to call them up. Uh, Camila Torres from Cedar Lane. Camila Clark from Cedar Lane. Christopher Borja from Cedar Lake. Emmanuel Morales. And Maximilian Mora. Congratulations. And we want to invite the families to come up and take a picture. Come on up and take a picture if you want to get a better camera angle. And our monthly staff awards goes to these who are in attendance. Thank you for being here. Alina Shelton from Kynock Elementary. Alicia Wiggins from Marysville High School. And Chris Babb from Kynock Elementary. Congratulations. Okay, um, so tonight we're recognizing the hard work of our Nutrition Services Department for their dedication and commitment that they demonstrate daily by preparing and serving over 10,000 meals to our students every day. Our team of 83 hardworking food service professionals work extremely hard to create delicious and appealing recipes, serving our students three meals a day at no cost to our parents. We prepare more meals in-house than the average school district and we purchase local seasonal produce grown in our community, including kiwis, mandarins, and peaches. So we have 83 that are recognized, but those tonight, we're going to call up Danielle Tillis, Karina Galvan, Galvan, Nick, Nick Dramus, Rose Hall, Sarah Rivera Salazar, sorry about the butch, Sandy McQuay, okay, okay, and Tina Bond, 
And I think Nick Dramas didn't hear his name, and Karina Galvin, please come up and get your certificate. Oh, you're right here. Thank you. Sandy McQuay's right here. <laughs> Rose Hall's right here. Oh, okay. Okay, come on up. Now we're going to move to the announcements of the election results. Trustee area number three was won by Dr. Yang. He ran uncontested. Trustee area number two, Frank Crawford, ran uncontested. Trustee area number four, were, was contested. The registered votes were 10,758 registered and votes cast were 6,417 votes. Turnout was 59.65%. Brett Butler came in with 2,339 and Seth Steeman came in with 2,754 and won the election. We welcome our new board members. <laughs> now we move on to the annual organization meeting of the Board of Trustees. Every year at this time, the Board of Trustees re-elects its leadership. So at this time, I turn the, the organization meeting to the superintendent, Dr. Zrani. Thank you. Um, this is a process for nomination of officers. I'm just going to read this out so that we understand the process. There is not a second to nominate a person to stand for election. We, so we need to just nominate a person is all we need to do. So there won't be a second. So can, can I have a nomination for board president, please? I'd like to nominate Randy Davis, please. Do I hear a second? Second. Can I have a vote from everybody on this? I mean, so everybody please vote all in favor. I need to have a head count by name. It's by name. Yeah. So Mr. Steeman? Dr. Yang? Mr. Duck Riddle? Ms. Allison Hasty? Yes. Uh, Mr. John, Mr. Frank Crawford? Okay, it's a, it's a full vote for Mr. Davis. Now we need to, will you preside over the vice principal? Yes. So thank you, board, for your confidence. We move on to the election of the vice president. Do I hear a nomination? Nominate Doug Criddle. 
I accept. Thank you. Doug Criddle. Okay, sorry. So Doug Criddle has accepted the nomination. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, Doug. You and Ms. Hasty have to shift. Right now? Yes. Oh. Thank you. Now we have the election of the clerk. Do I hear a nomination? I'd like to nominate Allison Hasty. Allison Hasty has been nominated. Do you accept? Yes. Allison Hasty accepts. Do I hear? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Allison Hasty is clerk. Thank you very much. Now we have, we're at 7.1, 7 appoint the superintendent as secretary of the board of trustees. Do I hear a motion? Motion, motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Dr. Yang. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Dr. Azrani is our uh, uh, sec secretary of the board. Authorize the superintendent and designees to sign warrants, contracts, and other documents. Do I hear a motion? Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second. Second by Doug Criddle. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? 7-0. Seven 7.5. Oh. I still do that. Sorry about that. Next one. 7-0. That's the next one. I'm this. How many? No matter how well they prepare this, the pages two stick together. Anyway, we are at 17.5, election of the trustee representative to the Special Education Council. Do I hear a nominee? I nominate Frank Crawford. Does Frank Crawford agree? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, that'd be great. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Now, 17.6, set the time and date and place of the regular meetings. We've had those uh, proposed dates for at least a couple of meetings. Are there any objections to any of those dates that have been proposed by the staff? I don't, I don't have any objections to the schedule for the one meeting per month, but I have two questions regarding having only one meeting. So number one is, will Tuesdays be the, the day for a special meeting? Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Hasty. That was really well asked. I think for consistency purposes, every special meeting, if we should choose to have any, should always be on Tuesdays. And my second question, I'm, I'm really glad that we can honor the time and streamline the time, but will anybody be left out of an opportunity, such as honor band students or academic students or FFA students being able to go on a trip? Will there be some way to have a provisional approval so that nobody misses out when they've worked really hard and they're not gonna miss out on an opportunity? Absolutely, because field trips and serving our students is why we are here. It just allows us to make sure the principals submit in advance all the ones that they know are going to happen in the course of the year, but for additional uh, um, field trips like FFA, you know, immediate, uh, we, we will just do provisional approvals, and then we will ratify them in the next meeting. Thank you. Yeah, we'll make sure it does not impact with student activities at all. I have an additional question. That was, uh, so same thing, I, I'm, um, also curious, you know, FFA does most of our field trips uh, that right now as, as a group. 
and sometimes those dates get canceled and they have to move those dates and that may possibly interfere with 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 the month-to-month -month meeting is there something in place or do we have a provisional thing in place maybe you could explain that so yes. that they're not out thank you yes and so thank you for that question again we will the way it's done in districts with one board meeting all field trips that we know are annual meetings are already prearranged and given to the superintendent's office, and it comes to the board in advance. For those that come up between board meetings, we approve them conditionally. It's like a provisional approval, and then the board ratifies that at the next board meeting. So at no time are students stopped from going to board meetings. And that usually happens for competitions like sports, CIF, you make it to the second round, you make it to the third round, and it's happening within a day. And so, absolutely, we'll make sure that those are never left out. We, we however, will work closely with principals to make sure that they let us, let us know well in advance when this is happening. So one of the reasons is that we don't want to use this provisional ratification as an excuse not to pre-plan in advance. So anything we can pre-plan because of parent permission slips, students' health issues, transportation arrangements should not be left for last minute. So the only ones provisional should be this sudden ones in between board meetings. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second. Second by Allison Hasty. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? S is 7 0. Okay. Now we have comments from the board members. Seth, do you have any comments? Dr. Yang? Allison? Yes. Welcome, members of the public. Welcome, new board members, Dr. Yang and Mr. Steeman. We all seven come from very different backgrounds. We have very different strengths, and I look forward to working together to become as effective as possible as a team to change the lives of our students and the future of our community. Also, I am delighted that Prop, 9, Prop 28 passed. I would like to underline that it is the only initiative that the Yuba County voters passed, so it is clear that our citizens want more arts and music. I am looking forward to having a workshop to explore the possibilities for putting more art and music into our schools most strategically and planning most effectively to benefit our students as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug? And none at this time. Frank? I would uh, just like to thank the great kids from Marysville High School for the gifts. Uh, as an old guy, I really love gifts. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Gary Criddle. Uh, just real quick, I want to welcome you guys aboard and congratulations on getting reelected again. Good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, hold I, the applause. Hold the applause till the end. Uh, I look forward to working with you, and, and all you really need to do this is just have a passion for the community, and um, we can make a lot of good things happen here. So, thank you. And I'd like to also formally welcome our new board members and our new year. Uh, we have accomplished a lot in this past year, and there's so much more to do. I'd also like to give a shout out to Bob Eckman um, for his help with the, F, uh, the uh, Lions um, uh, Socks, uh, stocking stuffing that we did at the this morning. Uh, he brought a crew over, and we just tried to stay out of the way to uh, uh, get these 500 uh, stockings that the Linda Lions Club uh, put together for the TK and K schools out in Olivehurst and Linda. So really appreciate that help. Now we have comments from the, from the school site representatives. Lenhurst. Good afternoon, board members, Superintendent Dr. Asrani Fall, and everyone here tonight. My name is Norberto Montero, and I'm the student board representative for Lenhurst High School. It has been a while since I've last been up here, but I come to you guys with a lot of information on what our clubs have been up to. So let's get started. 
I want to start off with our amazing sports medicine club who have been working hard going around asking for donations for their holiday dinners fundraiser, which gives our struggling students at Lyndhurst a whole holiday meal that's worth $50 for their family for this upcoming holiday season. They have fundraised enough money to provide 47 students and their families a holiday dinner this year. Next on the list is the Linder Mock Trial Club, who have been working hard to prepare for the Sacramento County competition this January. This week, they scrimmaged a Southern California school, Trinity Pacific, via Zoom to prepare for this competition. Students gave opening and closing statements, portrayed witnesses, delivered direct and cross examinations, and gave pre-trial arguments. Students are working hard to fundraise the amount needed to attend this competition and cover expenses such as transportation. Next on the list is our wonderful Lyndhurst Music Department that has had an awesome few weeks of performances. Over the last two weeks, the Blazer Band has performed for the students at Edgewater, Oliver's, Johnson Park, and Arboga Elementary Schools. This week, they will be at Linda and Ella. In addition, they had a successful winter concert in Potluck and had a full audience in the LHS cafeteria. Thank you to board member Ms. Hasty for coming to our performance at Johnson Park. We hope you all have a happy holiday from the LHS Music Department. I'm sure most of you have noticed, but it has become very chilly now, which is why our junior and freshman class are both holding a hot cocoa fundraiser this week at the stage and after school. Our OH club is currently selling their flowers of the month and plant of the month. As for ROTC, they are getting ready to perform at our rally this Friday, along with dance performances from our two dance clubs, Arsenal 5 and K Entertainment. Last but not least is our outstanding ASB and leadership club, who have been incredibly busy getting preparations ready for our rally this Friday. They have also started giving out incentives to students who have purchased an ASB sticker. Today was the start of our dress up week and today was bring anything but a backpack day. They will also start game days during lunch on Fridays where leadership will set up many life size games for our Linder students to have fun. Leadership along with our Interact Club, Mock Trial Club and FFA Club will be volunteering to help the So You Can organization this upcoming Saturday to help give back to our community. And with that information, I would like to thank you all for your time. Marysville High School, please say your name. Good evening, everybody. I am Maya Salino, and I serve as the ASB Vice President for Marysville High School. I'm here today to update you all on the exciting events happening here at MHS. So to catch up from the last couple weeks, we started November off with our tri-annual blood drive where we had 40 students donate blood. Then we had FFA Degree Week and Battle Week, where FFA members with their Green Hand degree were recognized. And our Battle Rally also concluded Battle Week, which was a great success. Our annual food drive was put on by ASB Leadership last month, and we had a care package drive put on by the MHS Business Club. Um, I would also like to announce some special recognitions for our November Students of the Month. So they would be Faith Sennett, Giselle Sanchez, Duan Siders, Colby Rowe, Davian Santiago, and Rodriguez Estrada Lua. Now, going into December, we had our Adopt-A-Family fundraiser and Coco and Cram with Link Crew in order to pr provide presents for homeless children in the community and prepare freshmen for their first year of finals. Um, also, going into the last week of, semest of the semester, MHS was excited to have the Yuba County Office of Education um, here yesterday at lunch to help students de-stress before finals. Students from Student Council handed out self-care bags, and we had a raffle where one of our students won a new pair of Beats headphones. Also, one of our attendance office secretaries, Ms. Maramar, was voted to be our December Staff of the Month by Student Council. Now, for some sports updates for the rest of the semester, boys basketball has games tomorrow versus Lincoln, a tournament in Rockland on Thursday, and a game versus East Nicholas on Friday. Boys soccer also has a game on Thursday against Bear River, and girls junior varsity basketball also has a tournament in Sutter. Girls soccer has a varsity game tonight in Colfax and will also be playing Thursday against Bear River. Also, a new update that I received while in this meeting, last night our boys basketball team won their game last night, so. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> now, finally, there is also a wrestling match scheduled for this Thursday against Las Plumas. And to wrap up the semester, we have finals this week starting tomorrow through Friday. Students will get out early at 12.50 and buses will run normal time Wednesday and Thursday, picking up students at 3.05. Due to students having to wait, our student body has scheduled movies in the South Auditorium and the Fieldhouse will be open until school buses arrive on campus. 
Now, I would also like to welcome Dr. Vang and Mr. Steeman for <laughs> joining the, more, the board. Um, and that is it. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful winter holiday. Thank you. <laughs> MCAA? Please state your name. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Hope Cross. I'm the representative for MCAA. Uh, MCAA has had a busy month filled with dances, musical performances, and holiday festivities. The MCAA dancers did an amazing job on December 2nd and 3rd when they performed for their annual winter dance recital. Most of the performances were student choreographed and directed. On December 3rd, the MCAA marching band took first place again in the Christmas parade. We now have almost a decade streak. Last week on Monday, the first group of piano students performed solos and duets. On Tuesday, the orchestra, band, and drumline gave impressive and entertaining shows. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> on Wednesday, choir, songwriting, and the second group of piano students played. Finally, on Thursday, all levels of guitar performed. It is, an incredi it is incredible to see such a talented group of students all conjoined in a community that truly values the arts. The variety of performances offered leaves no student left out. This week, we are celebrating the holidays and spreading positivity. We ran a booth yesterday at lunch for students to write encouraging notes. Today is Ugly Sweater Day. <laughs> uh, tomorrow is Dress Up as a Gift Day. Thursday is Holiday Hat Day, and Friday is Pajama Day. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful winter break. South Lyndhurst or North Lyndhurst? Opportunity for employee organizations to address the board. Marylandville Unified Teacher Association. Good evening, Mr. Davis and the rest of the board. Um, I'd like to also join the ranks of people who have been welcoming our new board members um, for this evening. Um, one of the things that I want to spend most of my time doing this evening is thanking all of the MUTA members um, for all of their hard work this year um, as we're finishing off a calendar year and we're about to hit winter break. But I would also like to thank everyone um, throughout our entire communities, all of our students and our parents, um, our businesses, all of our staff members um, from every school site up to the district office, um, everyone who has dedicated so much time, energy, and effort to the various activities um, undertaken at this time of year, um, from the various music performances um, to our food drives to adopt a family to the myriad of student activities and student performances that have gone on. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that your efforts and your time and energy, your spirit, are all noticed and greatly appreciated, um, actually more than just mere words. Um, also, I know that the first read of the Educator Effectiveness Grant is back on the agenda this evening, and so I just want to let you know that there are still some significant issues there. Um, I, we do appreciate the time that um, we have spent in speaking with Amy Stratton and with Jay Trujillo. Um, there are still some issues there, um, some kinks to work out. Um, I will, instead of spending a lot of time this evening on them, especially considering I'm not quite sure exactly how much voice I may have this evening, um, I will be emailing the board um, a lot of that information, especially since there are a lot of numbers and stuff that are involved in what I wanted to um, get across this evening. Um, but one of the issues that I do want you to kind of take away from, or one of the points I want you to take away from this evening in that first read is the fact that where MUTA has, um, I guess you would say our biggest issue is the fact that the vast majority of the funds now, and I do mean the vast majority of the funds, probably about 90% of the funds, um, are now going to um, a very small percentage 
um, of the educators in the district. And so the Educator Effectiveness Grant is meant to be more, um, I guess you would say, across the board um, and helping more of the teachers um, throughout that. Not saying that necessarily every single individual teacher, um, but when you get down to a very small percentage, 10% um, of the teachers being directly impacted um, by those grant funds, I think that's something that we need to address and look at. Um, I also want to give a personal thank you um, while I am here this evening um, to Jennifer Pasalia and Doug Trower. Um, they both came over and visited um, my two senior classes at the high school um, about a project that was discussed right here at the board. Um, and so I wanted to thank both of them for giving their time and coming over. My students both said they really appreciated it, both my classes. Um, they said it was amazing to actually um, have somebody come in, but they actually also felt like they were heard. Um, and so that's a big thing, especially with students and especially with high school students. So I appreciate both of you for giving your time and your energy for that. Um, I also wanted to give just a brief little update on the LMI, the Labor Management Initiative. Um, we had another LMI meeting, and um, we are making some progress. We now have five focus areas and some initial actions um, for those focus areas, um, things that we believe we can um, accomplish in the next one to four months. Um, so that was a very productive meeting. And additionally, I want to finish the evening off um, much in the same vein and spirit of our student representatives. Um, I want to wish everybody a very safe holiday season and also a very happy holiday season and enjoy the winter break and the rest of relaxation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Operating Engineers Local Union Number 3. California School Employees Associations number 326 and 648. Association of Management and Confidential Employees. Supervisory Unit. Now we're gonna to move to our presentations. Linda Elementary School Site Plan. Good evening, President Davis, board trustees, members of the district cabinet, members of the audience. Principal Zach Schultz, Linda Elementary School. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with this presentation that shares a little bit about our progress towards this year's site plan goals. Good evening, President Davis, Board of Trustees, Dr. Israni, Executive Cabinet, and members of the audience. This is Principal Zach Schultz here, representing the proud Lions of Linda Elementary School. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening to speak about the progress we are making in realizing the goals in this year's site plan. Our school plan for student achievement acts as a kind of roadmap for our decision making. We use it to ensure that money spent is aligned to one or more of our five school-wide goals. We're quite large for an elementary school. We have over 600 students with a wide range of grade levels from TK through sixth grade. Over a quarter of our student population are considered English language learners, and more than 80% of our population are considered socioeconomically disadvantaged. One of our school's mottos is, when you miss school, you miss out. This tagline is recited every day after the Pledge of Allegiance at the end of our morning announcements. This year, our assistant principal, Lori Whitmore, has started a positive incentive program in which students earn brag tags every month for maintaining good attendance. To address the increase in suspensions, our staff is receiving professional development on responding to crisis level behavior from district behavior analyst, Elena Morris, and our special day class teacher, Letty Collier. By the time you view this presentation, our staff will have received training from Elena and Letty during the staff work day on October 24th and a follow-up session during our staff meeting on October 26th. Additionally, 
I will be attending a two-day training on restorative practices on November 10th and 11th. Compared to the last school year in which students took the Smarter Balanced State Test, we saw a combination of slight increases and slight decreases in academic achievement at every grade level in both ELA and math. We are aiming to see a 10% increase for each grade level in both assessments for next spring's state testing. To facilitate this increase, we are reviewing effective research-informed instructional practices. For example, during the October 24th staff workday, our professional development included topics such as John Hattie's research and visible learning, our district priority standards, and the importance of communicating clear learning targets in student-friendly language. We referenced a variety of resources when assessing our needs. Data from the sources displayed in this grid represents some, but not all, of the information analyzed to develop Linda Elementary School's site plan. Our five school goals mirror our district's LCAP goals. Our first goal pertains to increasing academic achievement for all students. Many of the strategies employed to achieve goal one include staffing. New for this year, we have increased our PE teacher from half time to full time and this has resulted in the creation of common planning periods for general education teachers of the same grade level. We are also contra contracting with a retired teacher who now serves as an instructional coach and reading intervention specialist in Placer County. With goal number two, we are striving to make Linda Elementary a safe, positive, and productive environment that is conducive to learning for all. New for this year is the addition of a PBIS SEL paraeducator who works with students to learn social-emotional skills and strategies to help them self-regulate emotions so that they can get to a state of mind that permits them to learn. This specialist also runs our Lion Bucks store. Visit our school any Friday and you will see that almost all the students and staff are showing their lion pride and wearing their blue and white spirit gear. Every student received a lion pride t-shirt at the beginning of the school year. Through professional development opportunities, our staff are gaining skills and knowledge to incorporate appropriate levels of rigor and relevance into their instruction and increasing opportunities for our students to engage in the four C's to 21st century skills. A quarter of our students are English learners, and it is important that we work to meet their needs. Built into our master schedule is a 30-minute block of designated ELD instruction for each grade level. Several of our teachers have been trained in Guided Language Acquisition Design, or GLAD, which is a set of effective and research-informed instructional strategies that support English language acquisition. Four of our teachers and I are participating in a training through SCOE, known as the English Learner Roadmap Implementation for Systematic Excellence, or just ELRISE for short. We are constantly seeking ways to build connections with our families and facilitate both one-way and two-way communications in a variety of ways. Last year we started holding evening events again, such as family dinner night and open house. These events have so far been well attended and are proving to be one of the best ways to connect with our families. By the time you have viewed and heard this presentation, we will have held our fall festival on October 28th. 
This is an event that staff and parents have been planning and preparing for several weeks in advance. Our budget for the current school year includes the funding sources shown here. Our Title I and targeted funds are used to meet our site plan and LCAP goals. Our school site council is met in September and October and based on the dialogue held at both meetings, we have already made adjustments to the plan that have resulted in better use of funds to meet student needs. At the time of this presentation's recording, it is late October. School has only been in session for a little less than two and a half months. However, we have had so many events, experiences, projects, and initiatives happen that the first day of school seems like a long time ago. We still have much to accomplish this year, but are excited for the work we have ahead of us and are optimistic that our efforts will result in increased achievement for all students. Again, many thanks for this opportunity to share. I am happy to answer any questions you may have, or feel free to reach out if you think of anything you'd like to ask or discuss in the future. Thank you, sir. You're doing a fabulous job there. I appreciate it, sir. Jack, how, how long have you been with us? Uh, 13 months. Yeah, you're putting up some good numbers. Um, I, it shows that your leadership is, something's working there, right? So nice job. Um, you know, that EL roadmap is, is a good program. And I think after you guys and you and your crew get through that, uh, you're gonna be able to increase those ELD numbers, so. Absolutely. Right, good job. Are. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions for Mr. Schultz? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have Kynock Elementary. Good evening, Dr. Asrani, President Davis, newest members of the board. Can I call the old guard? Is that what we would call you? <laughs> okay. Members of the cabinet and members of the audience. My name is Derek Morrison. I'm the principal at Kynock Elementary. And at the time of this recording, um, my vice principal had resigned. So you get my counterpart in this presentation. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. Good evening, board trustees, Dr. Asrani, members of the cabinet, and those who are attending in the audience. Welcome to Kynock Elementary's board presentation for the 2022-2023 school year. Tonight's board presentation is hosted by Mr. Morrison, the site principal, and his sidekick, Batman. As one unified district and one united front, Kynock's plan sounds very familiar to the presentations that you have heard before. In the next few moments, we would like to share what makes us unique to the district and share with you some of the celebrations and areas of focus. Being aware of what our students and families need from a school has been our focus. Based on the results of multiple surveys, as well as a variety of data points, we strive to tailor our program to meet the needs of every student who passed through the doors of our site. Our focus areas have been school culture and climate, academic offerings and support, behavior and discipline, parent involvement, and teacher support. Currently, our school site enrollment is the fourth largest in the district with 714 TK through fifth grade students attending. Some of the exciting data that we have to share is that, number one, we reclassified 13 EL students this year. Our daily attendance averages are on the rise. Our alternatives to suspension are paying off with a significant reduction in the amount of students suspended from school. Our CASP data speaks for itself. Normally, a person would look at these graphs and be depressed, but we seek to find the positive. Looking at the number of students who met or exceeded the standards 
All of our grade levels showed growth in each subject area. Our goal for this year is to continue that climb and see less blue and red on those graphs and more green and yellow. MJUSD has adopted five LCAP goals, which are reflected in our site plan. Goal three that focuses on college and career readiness is not written into Kynox site plan yet, but we will work with sites within the district to discover ways that we can incorporate them here too. LCAP goal one focuses on improving academic performance, engaging various identified needs of all Kynox students. We have allotted funds that can help us do that by providing PD for staff, updating technology, a full-time LRT, online subscriptions, materials to supplement the curriculum, continue to supply our book vending machines, strong team of paras to help mitigate learning gaps in our youngest grades. As Mr. Morrison mentioned already, our para team is more focused this year and is working with our youngest learners to mitigate the learning gaps when they're not subbing in classrooms. Our students love the book vending machines and work hard to earn trips to them. Upgrades to classroom technology is almost complete. Hopefully by the end of winter break, all classrooms will have new laser projectors installed. Alfred, can you get on that? Data will continue to be what drives us and we will work with Dr. Trujillo and his team to sharpen our skills when it comes to that area. School culture and climate are the focus here at Kynock as well as physically safe campus. LCAP goal two focuses on these aspects. LCAP goal number four focuses on diverse community of learners. In goal four, we aim to meet our students where they are and help them along the journey to becoming the leaders of tomorrow. Our path leading us there includes commitments to multi-tiered systems of supports, strengthening our EL strategies used in the classroom, and providing support for our classroom teachers through our EL facilitator. There are so many things to celebrate in goal four, like 13 EL students reclassified this year. That's the largest number that Kynock has had in recent years. Kudos to our students and to our team. Our PBIS team meets monthly to find ways to improve the experience that our students have here on a daily basis. Data collected from teachers and staff will guide this discussion and planning. And our students work really hard in the classroom and around campus to be recognized on the Morrison Minute, which can be found on our website under the Parents tab. Without the support of the community and the educational partners, we could not do what we do. We have made it a priority to reach out and connect with them on a regular basis. We strive to do this by maintaining positive interactions with families and educational partners, keep families in the know by providing the paw print on a monthly basis, as well as the Sunday summary every Sunday afternoon, using surveys at the end of every trimester to provide a checkup on how we are doing as a school. Some of the ways that we connect with families are, parents can connect with the admin team through the I need to see the principal tab on the website. Monthly events that connect school to home is something we have been wanting to do and are proud to say we're finally taking it on this year. We will continue to be available to listen to what the parents desire in their children's school experience. Opportunities like questions and answers with admin will allow parents and community members to have a voice on our campus. Well, how do we do all of this? Well, it takes money. And here's how the allocations have been dispersed at our site. Our total budget is $683,060. In Title I, $304,975 plus $2,620 have been allotted for that. Targeted, $204,782. Our lottery monies, $161,355.17. LCAP, $1,028. LCAP Music, $2,500. And LCAP Science, $5,000.
$5,800. We want to thank you for your time and commitment to our students. As always, there's an open invitation to come and see the good things that are happening here at Kynock Elementary. If you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to respond to them now. Have a great rest of your day and go Cubs! Thank you, Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the board? Well, you're doing a fantastic job there, Thank and you. it was wonderful to see the, the success you're having with your discipline. Thank you. That's an enormous um, achievement, and uh, we really appreciate everything you and your staff are doing. Thank you very much. I will relay that to the staff. Thank, Thank you. you. I hear having a good thing. We're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Now we have Olive Hurst Elementary with Santa Claus. I didn't know I was supposed to bring Batman or things like that, so I could probably do a Yogi the Bear, like, hey, no boo boo, let's get some <laughs> picnic baskets, yeah? Um, besides that, that's about as good as I can do other than, ho, 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 Merry Christmas, because I do get to play Santa. but. This is my last three days at Olive Hurst as the principal. Most, some of you may know and some of you may not know as being new. Our new principal, Heather Marshall. So I'm gonna give her a quick chance to say hello to the board too, just to get a chance. Hi, good evening. Um, board, Superintendent Osrani, cabinet, uh, members of the public that are left here. I don't do any voices, <laughs> apologies in advance, but I'm really happy to be here and excited to move over to Olive Hurst. So thank you. So you will be happy to know that my whole presentation does stay under eight minutes. I did follow the directions, under like, not like some of my colleagues, so it's seven minutes and 46 seconds to exact, and so I made sure to do that. So you'll be happy to know that part about it. And then afterwards, I'll ask, uh, be here to answer any of your questions. And I, get, I, I wanna thank all of you for, that are here this evening. Thank you, board, for the opportunities that you have presented and allowed me even for the last three and a half years here at Olive Hurst, my nine years at Ella is the principal and seven years at Cedar Lane. So I'm excited to move on and do some new things, but this is a, a great time and you picked a great person. I'm very excited for all of her, and Heather's a great uh, a nominee for that. So here we go. And welcome to the Oliverse Elementary Board presentation. For all Oliverse Eagles soar in a positive, safe, and supportive community, fly high. I'm Rob Greger, the principal. Heather Marshall will be the principal starting uh, as of this coming Friday. Our assistant principal is John Green. I want to thank Dr. Fall Asarani, Dr. Trujillo, and Dr. Simon for this opportunity to present before you, the board. I also want to welcome Chong Yang and Seth Steeman to the group. Thank you, and we look forward to serving with you. This is our opportunity to tell about all the great things that Oliverst Elementary is doing as a site. We are continuing to grow, and that is happening through our purpose and our site plan. Oliver's has developed a school plan for a student achievement. We call that a SIPSA. Uh, it meets the essential guidelines for every student succeeds act. What we do is we make sure all children have an opportuni opportunity to receive a fair, equitable, and high quality education. We work close with education achievement gaps. We're trying to help our students with disability, low-income students, and students that are coming from minority uh, situations and EL learners. All of First Elementary, we engage in a timely and meaningful consultation with our stakeholders, and we make sure that all of them are a part of this as we develop our SIPSA. The plan is developed in with the Marysville Joint Unified School District's LCAP, which is the Local Control and Accountability Plan. Our school has 475 students enrolled as of today. We are currently full in our TK, our third, our fifth, and and 34% are English learners. As of last year, we had a 89.8% attendance rate. Our Oliver's uh, Eagles, we continue to use interventions in lieu of suspension. At this point, we've had one student who's been formally disciplined, uh, and that person has had that twice. 
Our state and local student achievement is called our CASP, and that is from our last year's test scores. And you can see that in third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, uh, the scores are in ELA, 23% math, 18% ELA, 15% math, 29% in ELA for fifth, and 10% math, and then sixth grade, 17%, and then 12% for math. The two little charts off to the right here, uh, they show our overall growth for the last several years. And you can see what we've done in third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Obviously, there are no scores there during the COVID time. We did make improvement from last year uh, by more than 5%, and we continue to move towards that for the following school year. We do a comprehensive needs assessment, and basically what we're doing is we take all the data that we have and we put it into our SIPSA, and we try to find ways to provide interventions and get our students at grade level is the goal. Uh, right now, we have majority of our kids are not at grade level, so we are working towards bringing them to grade level, and we do that by using the CASP and looking at how our students did in ELA math and then fifth grade science data. We look at students' LPAC scores, uh, how our reclassification is working. Our chronic absenteeism is a part of that and our suspension. And as we look through all that, we try to find ways to bring intervention through our positive behavior intervention and supports, which is PBIS. In addition to that, we have an ASB. We talk with our ELAC, our site council, and then obviously our most important goal members, which is our staff. And we try to get everybody together and then we take our district allotted funds and the state allotted funds federally too and we put those together to be able to bring five interventions such as tutoring uh, making sure we have professional development uh, support in our el and other areas to make sure we get that home connection our goals are simple lcap goal one is to improve academic performance by creating an academic system that addresses and engages the various identify needs of all all of our elementary students we use supplemental hours for plc time we get focused on high quality instruction and we try to target essential grade level standards in el math and also eld we provide ongoing pd for staff we have a technology lead and then we have some supplementals that we put into place to help out get materials and technology into the classrooms we provide books uh, for the library and then we also have some contracts and service agreements the second goal is to create an environment that addresses the physical and emotional and safety needs of all students. We use supplemental materials related to social emotional learning in the grades TK through six to promote social skills, mindfulness, resilience, and critical thinking. We do our PBIS school wide, and we also have a school counselor and some ORCs that continue to help and work towards that. Goal three is we prepare every student with the skills needed for college and career readiness. We have a technologies uh, needed for a 21st century classroom, and we continue to try to upgrade all of our technology. Uh, we've had cultural and career days, spirit days, and we target the activities focused on these cultural college and career mindset, and we try to have student leadership also. In our goal number four, we work on build a system of specific support for our EL learners. Uh, what we do is we make sure we have EL paraphrasing professionals that work directly in the classrooms with the teacher to provide interventions. We also provide supplemental curriculum if needed for the ELD instruction. And then we make sure on our master schedule that we have 30 minutes of designated ELD time every day for our students. We continue on with our LCAP 5, which is our home and school partnerships. Uh, we have back to school night, uh, meet and greet, uh, parent-teacher conferences, behavior celebrations, which is our golden tickets, Title I meetings, uh, which we do with our ELAC, uh, monthly newsletter that goes out to parents. We also have a site uh, weekly newsletter that we do called Eagle Excellence. Uh, we have a Read Across America Day, field trips, and cultural days that we do to get our parents involved. Our budget total with carryover is $571,058, and you can see our fundings reflected in the site plan. Uh, we have Title I, we had 135,000 plus carryover, targeted 147 plus carryover, and lottery 93 plus 1,000 plus another 113 carryover. You see we also get a little bit of LCAP and music uh, and parent involvement to go along with that. Uh, here at Oliver's, we always are trying to celebrate all the great things that are doing at our site, and we want to continue to fly high. And all of our Oliver's Eagles are trying to continue to build a positive, safe, and supportive community. I want to thank everyone uh, for being here tonight. I want to thank the board members and our 
cabinet for allowing us, uh, all of Hearst Eagles, to continue to fly high and supporting us in every way that you do. Uh, we want to thank our new principal that's coming in and Heather Marshall, and we're looking forward to all the great things that she's going to bring uh, to our site starting here in January. So again, I want to thank all the board members. Um, again, thank you for uh, allowing us to serve you and obviously serve our students and our family of Hall of Hearst Elementary. And again, thank you to our new board members, Chong and Seth. Welcome to the Marysville family and we look forward to the years to come and all the great things that we're gonna to continue to do here at Hall of Hearst Elementary. Thank you very much. I didn't know I had that many S's in my slurring there, the, the sound. I felt like a, Sally was gonna sell seashells at the seashore. The hope we have is that you've set the stage and the incoming principal will take the baton and, and raise that flag even higher. So we really, really appreciate everything you've done there and at Ella. Are there any other questions for the, from our senator? I agree. Thank you for all that you've done. Appreciate it. And I think we're in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'd just like to do a quick comment for our new board trustees. Um, one of the things that we have been doing since last year and more consistently this year is all the school plans are pre-taped and presented. Not only are they presented here for the audience, but they're also posted tomorrow morning on the school's website. And the reason is for transparency and ongoing education of the community. The question has often come to me, why can't the people present here? Yes, they can present, but when a person wants to see the presentation, then it doesn't look as professional as a pre-taped, which is the facts absolutely clear. And you'll see more of that work when the district starts presenting the LCAP and other programs as well. So thank you for your patience with these presentations. Now we have technology. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my presentation will uh, speak for itself, and then I will be available for any questions. So thank you. Hello, board members, Dr. Israni, fellow cabinet members, and the MJUSD community. My name is Brian Williams, and I am the chief technology officer for the district. And it is my pleasure to present to you tonight an update on the MJUSD Technology Department and to go over the department goals for the 2022-2023 school year. To start, I would like to acknowledge my staff in the Technology Department. I have long said that I have the best staff and that continues to be true today. We may not have as many people as other districts do in their Technology Departments, but I will put the service level that my staff provides up against anyone. They make my job easier each and every day. I would also like to thank the 22-23 Technology Advisory Committee, or TAC. We had our first meeting last month, and I was very pleased with the discussion and knowledge available in the room. This group is going to be invaluable in helping to determine the direction of technology within the district moving forward. I know that we have a couple of new board members with us tonight, so I thought I would take a moment to go over the different areas that the technology department supports. While cybersecurity is a focus throughout all of K-12 right now, we still need to make sure that our teachers and our staff are able to perform their jobs at the highest level, and we work hard to stay ahead of the ever-changing technology landscape. Now, moving into the department goals for the 22-23 year. I was fortunate enough to be part of the strategic plan committee last year. We worked hard to collect input from all of the educational partners of the district, and in doing so, we were able to put together a three-year strategic plan for the district. That plan identified five goals. As you can see, the word technology does not appear in them at all. However, one of the things I love most about my job 
is that the technology department has the opportunity to directly serve and support every single person in the district, whether it be students, parents, or staff. So while you may not see the word technology in these goals, the technology department will play a supporting role in each and every one of them. And in doing so, I have identified three primary goals for the 22-23 school year. Goal number one lines up with the strategic plan goal four, action item two, and it is enhanced community input opportunities for expanded technology infrastructure. This goal comes with two action items. The first action item focuses on cybersecurity training for students and staff. We are looking into online video trainings, a cybersecurity newsletter, and other ways to reach the end user to make sure they are aware of potential cyber threats. We will also be working with the TAC to select a multi-factor authentication system. This will keep us in compliance for insurance purposes and also make the district safer as a whole. The second action item is similar but goes beyond the security part of being online and instead focuses on the way our users act online. I have said that schools have always taught students how to behave on the playground and the internet is the new playground for our kids. It is critical that we teach them how to be safe and how to be responsible when they are online. Goal number two is aligned with strategic plan goal two, action item four. Develop a technology budget process to support district-wide infrastructure for safety, teaching, and learning. The first action item for this goal is to develop a five-year projected budget for technology. As you all know, technology is not cheap, and unfortunately, it doesn't last forever. Having a replacement plan in place is crucial. This is going to become an even bigger issue for school districts in the next two to four years because of the pandemic. Our district, like many others, used COVID funds to purchase a large number of computers and Chromebooks. While that is great for now, in two years, when all of them begin to go obsolete at the same time, it will be important that we have a plan to keep everyone updated and working effectively. The second action item focuses on campus security. The current estimated cost to upgrade our intercoms, security cameras, and door buzzers is approximately $5.4 million. As funds become available, we will work to improve our security throughout the district, as it is one of the main priorities for the district as a whole. For starters, we are currently working on a plan for this school year to move every school over to an IP intercom system. This will improve the intercom systems throughout the district, making it easier for all calls and other information to be shared at each of our campuses. The final goal for the 22-23 school year is aligned to the Strategic Plan Goal 3, Action Item 1, and Goal 4, Action Item 2. The first action item is to find ways to better provide professional development to our staff, both certificated and classified. This was another focus of the TAC meeting held last month. With their support, I am confident that we can put a plan together to assist all of our staff. The second item for goal number two is to work with adult education to provide technology certification courses. We are expanding this beyond just the adult ed students though, and soon we will be holding our first seminar for parents on social media and how kids are using the various applications. We are very excited to be able to bring these seminars to our parent community. With that, I would like to thank everyone for your time and attention, and I am available for any questions you may have. Thank you again. Are there any questions for Brian? I, I thank you. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you for bringing that. I think it's unfortunate that um, we only think of technology when it doesn't work. So make sure that you tell your team, hey, you're doing a great job. It's when we don't hear about it is when things are working. So that's awesome. Um, the one comment, and it, it's not really a comment, more of a just a throwing a dart out there. The, the end of life on some of these devices, it's inevitable. It's going to come. And in previous experience, there are particular devices that we can't reuse, repurpose after we're done with them. And I would make the suggestion of maybe shifting our focus, looking farther out of, okay, when this particular device, once it reaches the end of life, what do we do with it after the fact is, do we send it to the dumps or can we repurpose it and give it to a student or someone who can keep using that, that device? No.
Thank sure, you and, and I, we, we do have some limitations on that because it's government funds that we use it. Uh, we, are, we actually need to go to auction to, to make those available to the public to purchase. Um, we've looked into doing that in the past, and to be honest, the uh, amount of money we spent in man hours preparing the auction was more than we were getting back in the, because the devices are so old, so it's part of the reason why we haven't been, um, and they end up going to uh, electronic recycling most of the time. So. Well, I just would like to offer the tremendous um, work that you're, you and your team have done. And it has been easy. Um, and all the work you did during the COVID, I, I don't think anybody, anyone can appreciate the many, many man hours that were put into supporting that effort. And since then, uh, it's been to review and to upgrade our security. And you've been f ahead of the crowd and, and looking ahead at that. So we really, really appreciate you and, and your staff for all that hard work. Well, thank you very much. I have the best staff. I really do. Any other questions? Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Now we have updates by Department of Business Services. Jennifer. Hi. Yes, thank you. I just want to thank Marysville High School for these treats. I appreciate that. And I just want to wish everybody a happy holidays and a restful break. I just want to echo what my colleague uh, Jennifer said and thank the high school. Thank you for the treats. I already tried it. It's fudge and I love fudge. So um, I just want to say what a humbling experience I had this week. Actually, it's been the last couple of weeks, uh, the, the food drive that the district office staff was uh, conducting. Uh, it, we raised, as a district office staff, over 1,500 cans that are going to be going to the local free food bank and um, the So You Can uh, organization. Uh, it was a friendly competition between upstairs staff and downstairs staff. You know, I'm downstairs, and we thought we had it until the last minute. And then, man, we were hammered with a whole bunch of cans. Uh, it's friendly competition, but it's for a very worthy uh, cause, and it was humbling to be a part of, and I just want to thank everyone who was a part of it. So that's it for me, and Merry Christmas, and Happy Holidays to everybody. Thank you. Personnel? Thank you. Um, we have submitted a, up to a $250,000 um, applica uh, application for $250,000 to commission on teacher credentialing for a teacher residency grant. So thanks to Angela, Dave Vujovic, and our grant writing team. Hopefully, uh, we'll find out in the next couple of weeks if we achieve that grant or not. We'll be to, su to support mentors as well as student teachers to do paid residencies in our district, which will help increase the pipeline for the future for hiring new staff. Um, we're excited about that. We also have over 10 classified staff members participating in a consortium with Placer County Office of Education to obtain their bachelor's degrees or teaching credentials. So that's exciting uh, to see them pursuing those dreams. Um, we're also back at the table with uh, MUTA and appreciate the collaboration um, and the work we've done at LMI and with MUTA to continue to develop relationships and reach agreements. And then we are um, just starting the look at the calendar for next year and collaborating with Yuba County Office of Ed to do that. So more on that to come. Thank you. Any more, Brian, from technology? Okay. Thank you for enough for me tonight, so I will pass. Okay, Superintendent. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's been a, a really busy month around Marysville, and as you heard, a lot of wonderful um, cheery competitions and concerts that are happening across our schools. And I want to thank our teachers, I want to thank our families and our principals for the dedication and the time they give to our students. And we are here for our children. That's what we prioritize and our North Star. And so thank you for everything that everybody does uh, to keep our kids safe. And, and you heard the fun that the district office is doing in raising cans for our families of students we serve as well. And uh, a big shout out to Marysville for the wonderful music they showed us today. And I know Ms. Hasty has been particularly um, 
focused in making sure that I don't lose my focus on, the, on music and arts in our schools. So we will be back with Prop 28 Planning Committee, which is already in place. Uh, she asked a question what we have done so far, and we've done quite a bit already, and so we'll bring that to you. Um, I would also like to recognize, um, again, as you saw, the CSBA conference last week or the week before was, was a wonderful time. Thank you, Dr. Yang, uh, Mr. Duck Riddle, Gary Riddle, and thank you, Mr. Davis, for being there with us. I think we learned a lot together, but most importantly, the, 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 the shining glory was to see one of our schools walk away with the statewide mathematics award. And why it's so important is, I think as a district, we have never applied for the CSBA awards before. And uh, as I keep saying, all of us, as we mentioned, we work so hard. Our teachers work so hard, our staff work so hard, and we have some excellent programs. So we applied for three. You are allowed to apply for three, and out of 1,000 plus school districts, we walked away with one of the three. And isn't that a wonderful achievement? And so this year, we'll be applying for another three, and I believe Mr. Trujillo is already on that. So thank you, Mr. Trujillo. Uh, I have the honor of working with a fabulous cabinet. I think I, I always thank our teachers and our staff, and I never ever thank my cabinet. I think they just make me step up a little bit more to my job, make me do things a little better, think uh, a little better every day. And while I was gone this past week, uh, these four people here just held the fort and made sure I didn't get any uninterrupted emails and calls and during this time that I was out for a family hardship. Um, I also want to con congratulate and welcome Mr. Steeman, Dr. Yang, to, the, to our team, our governance team of eight. We've worked really well. We welcome you and your different thinking to challenge us to do what we need to do to do what's best for our children again and our teachers and our staff. Um, Finally, um, also thank you so much for appointing Karen Dow. I think she'll do an excellent job as a new principal of Cordova and Bronze Valley, and of course, the work that uh, will be done by Heather Marshall and Oliver is going to be um, instrumental in the next phase of that school. And also thank you for supporting us with the hiring of the new director of wellness, as you heard today and in the presentation. So proud of Kynock and Oliver's for having the suspensions thus far to one child is unthought of. Uh, we were at CSBA and we heard that the trauma children are facing is, nation is nationwide and California especially is really struggling with student behaviors. And so certain schools in our district are seeing more of it. Um, and then we are here with the director of wellness to bring those resources to them. I want to wish the community a wonderful uh, holiday season. And I think we've all come this far. It's so quick. Just the other day we started school and now in December, when you work hard and you enjoy what you do, time just flies, doesn't it? Uh, but everybody have a safe holiday, and thank you to our Board of Trustees for your dedication and your support of the work that everybody is doing in this district. We couldn't do this without your mentorship and your guidance, so thank you. One thing I wanted to bring up was that uh, MCAA won $1,000 with that award, and it was so uh, interesting, uh, Dr. Osrani and I were sitting together and I, I, they had these gigantic checks and they were sitting right behind their podium. And I, I was trying to focus and I thought, that looks like Marysville. And I'm going, what is, uh, and then next thing you know, they gave us that, uh, that award. And so it was a total surprise. We did, none of us knew that was going to happen, and it was just so cool that our Golden Bell Award winner and MCA's principal were able to accept that for the district. It was, it was quite a moment. So now we move into the approval of minutes. We have the approval of the November 8, 2022 regular board meeting minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Do I hear a second? Second by Allison Hasty. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5-0. The two new members abstain. <laughs> okay. Just so you know why we I said five instead of seven. Then we have the approval of the November 14th, 
2022 special board meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to that, um, those agenda, that, uh, that minutes to, for that meeting? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved. motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second. Second by Doug Quiddle. All those in favor say aye. 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 Abstain. Yeah. So we it's approved something like four O. So then we have now it's three O, it doesn't pass. Four. There were there were there were four. The people at the meeting were four. It's just uh, minutes. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Thank you. Now we have the approval of the consent agenda items. Are there any items in the consent agenda that members of the board want to pull for further discussion? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved. Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second. Second by Doug Quiddle. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7-0. Now we move to new business. First item of new business, 19.1, approve the updated administrative regulation 5117, enter district attendance. Do we have staff? Hello, I'm Zachary Platt. I'm the Director of Student Welfare and Attendance, and I have a short presentation just to kind of walk through some of these pieces. Um, our uh, AR5117 is really concerning our inter-district transfers. So an inter-district transfer is when a student who belongs to us because they live in our attendance zone is moving to another school district, or vice versa if a student's coming from outside of our school district and wants to come into our school district. Um, one of the pieces that we wanted to kind of talk about is that our district has historically lost more students than it has gained. And so one of the pieces that we wanted to present to you today is just talking about um, those numbers and how many students are actually leaving our district. So we can go to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, so this is just by site. These are the percentage of students that leave and some of the numbers in terms of number of students that if they were at their home site where they would be located. Now some of these sites for like Yuba Gardens might have left when they were in third grade and would just be, but currently right now they're a seventh or eighth grader so you're seeing their numbers represented in that way. Um, total we have 989 students who are with, live within our school district who do not attend our schools. Go ahead to the next slide thing. Um, where are those students going? That's the next question. They go to most of our neighboring students. Um, so some of the, the largest one you're gonna see is um, Wheatland Elementary School District. That's the dark blue with almost 400 students. And then um, the Wheatland High School District has about 117. And then um, Plumas Lake is uh, 111. Yuba City, we had 129 that go that direction. Um, generally speaking, most of these are just students we send to. Um, Yuba, uh, Yuba City is a little bit different. They send us about a, they send us approximately about the same number of students. So we kind of trade back and forth in terms of students coming and students going. Um, and then we do have some other smaller ones. When we look at ADA lost, um, we talk about the average amount we get per student and then kind of multiply that. We do get a slightly different rate depending on what grade level they're in. And we'd have a more broken out chart that I can share with uh, staff or with the uh, board later. But what we're seeing right now is kind of the fiscal impact. Um, last year it was about $8 million that we lost. This year it would be about $9 million. And the goal really was to try to reduce the total number of students who are leaving every year. And so that's why you see that number starting to reduce and go down. The idea was that if we should, kept the students who have already left and not bring them back, but just let them, the ones who are already gone, um, we kind of said they're already, they're already out of our district, we're not seeing them come back, but reduce the number of students who are leaving. That's why you see that reduction in total number of cost. Um, but basically, if you reduce, a, you know, lease a student in kindergarten, you lose them for 13 years if they never come back. And so that cost obviously continues. Um, uh, this year, we only actually went, I went look through our numbers. The vast majority of students have already left the district. Two years ago, we had 400 students who were new that had left. Um, last year, that number was greatly reduced. And this year, we've only reduced, uh, we released 44 students. So the number is really declined in terms of the total number of new students that we're releasing, but still as of right now, we have close to 1,000 who are um, currently outside of our school district. Um, the last pieces we're gonna be updating is our um, administrative regulations, our AR5117. 
Um, last year, the board adopted a new board policy around this, but we did not adapt the administrative regulations that go with it. These administrative regulations that we're going to be putting in place, uh, hopefully tonight, would um, not only uh, correspond with the new district policy, but it also include some language around district of choice. Um, recently, we've had a couple of schools in our neighboring areas who become district of choice programs. A uh, district of choice is a state-run program. It's pretty rare. There's only a handful of schools that use it across the state. I think it's like 30, maybe 40 school districts in the entire state are districts of choice. And when a school becomes, a, or district becomes a district of choice, we as a, a home district cannot um, stop a student from leaving it. They go through the district of choice um, kind of window. It's a very narrow window when they need to apply. They have to apply kind of in this winter time. Um, and apply before December 31st. But if they apply under the district of choice, I, as the representative of the school district, can't decline any of those transfers. Um, the only real restrictions that are placed on them are percentages. And that's one of the things that this AR 5117 policy would put in place. District of choice, um, we are allowed to cap at 3% every year and no more than 10% over the four year course of the application. Um, this is something that we're continuing to kind of look at and it's going to have to be some negotiating. We're working with the other district to make sure we're getting that information. Because unlike in a current system where they apply to me and then I sign off on it and then it leaves, through the district of choice, they actually can go directly to the district they want to go to and they don't really have to inform us directly. So it is making sure that, that districts, the districts who are applying for district of choice are giving us back that information about which students they are taking from us. Um, currently, right now, East Nicholas is a district of choice. They've been like that for a while now. Um, and Wheatland High School District has applied to become a district of choice for the upcoming school year. Um, so those are the pieces that the AR 5117 policy ad address. Uh, does any member of the board have any questions or concerns that I can address at this time? Just a clarifying question. Could you repeat again how many students were, received approved permits this year to leave the district? 44. 44. Yeah. So I wanted to mention to the board, if you remember last February, one of the tasks I was given by the board was to identify areas for fiscal uh, solvency for the district. And um, the question that I asked automatically is what is, and I had no idea that that was an issue for us. And my question I had asked, and I had brought the presentation to you, Ms. Jolie Critchfield, our previous director, did that very detailed presentation last February, and we showed you this exact figure that you saw, which is a $48 million loss in the course of the lifetime of the number of students that have already received their permit. And the reason I'm repeating this again is because 1,000 children who are already gone, we can't get them back. But what I do want to appreciate and the work of our staff and, and let you know, which is important, is the work that Jolie's office and now Zach has been doing is stopping that open, um, I don't know what you want to call it, but the door where kids were just leaving our district. We brought it down from 400 the previous year to 44 this year, which was a commitment we made to the board. So fiscally, thank you, Zach, for all your work. And of course, Jolie, prior to you, but mm -hmm. thank you for bringing us AR 5117, which is asking the board to approve this AR. ARs don't usually come to the board, but this one is asking for a cap. So we do need the board to give us your approval on this one. Any questions, we'll take those. Any questions from the board? I, I do have a question. It's just a clarification. Could you reverse back to the slide where, and it's just so, so that I understand context, <clears throat> reverse back to the slide right there. You mentioned that Yuba City basically nets, uh, we trade basically the same number of students. Of that chart, um, Wheatland, uh, Plumas Lake, and uh, both high school and Wheatland, both high school and the school district, do we trade back any of their students at all, or is it? I mean, I'm not saying there's zero, but it's very, very minuscule. So we, those other districts we tend to send students to, we don't get very many. We don't get a lot of like kids from East Nicholas. They just, uh, I think partly it's just the commute patterns. We don't have a lot of families that are commuting from East Nicholas this direction. We have a lot more that are going towards Sacramento. So they go through some of those areas in the south part of our county. So we, but very, very few, a uh, handful at most, um, maybe a dozen. So, so the, uh, just so that I understand since I wasn't here before, so that 48 million does account for trading back and forth between Yuba City 
uniform. No, well, this is just accounting for the 900 kids who have left. It doesn't count the students we do bring in. We do have some students that we do bring in, so that could, be, and I'm happy to give you those exact numbers of how many we bring back in. It would cut that number down, but the overall um, net loss would still probably be in the 900 range. Okay, so that 48 million is basically the top ceiling number that uh, of loss revenue. Yeah, process. the goal of that number was really to show those are students that technically belong to us who are leaving. Okay. versus students who are requesting to come into our district for other reasons. Okay, thank you. No problem. A uh, demography report, and I don't know if you two have seen that, um, does track where our students are coming from. So that, uh, we need to get you a copy of, of that report, and that'll help give you the fuller picture of the, the comings and going. And, and there is a trade, but not, not enough to offset that, that huge number we're losing. So, any other questions? Um, yeah, more of an observation than anything. I, I think at the end of the day, we're a business and we're losing our customers. But on the other hand, I, I'm all about freedom of choice and giving parents the choice to choose the district they want to go. I see this as, for lack of a better word, a Band-Aid. What I'm really seeing, what I'm really looking at is there's a problem here. It's their choice. Why are they choosing to leave? And I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts, our schools are already impacted. They're, they're overloaded. We're the, if, we, if we do this and we still keep these kids from leaving, that's gonna even overflow us even further. So now we have an infrastructure problem. Just thinking ahead. And I don't know if that was a question. I think there was a suggestion in there somewhere and a dart thrown at me. But it is true. We have been discussing the need for the district to build new facilities, whether it be new schools or whether it be addition like Overlord with new wings to house more children. One of the reasons we see such a huge, huge exodus from the uh, to the Wheatland Elementary School District and Plumas Lake, you could very well uh, understand that that's a majority of them are Edgewater children. Uh, parents bought homes in the Edgewater community, thinking that Edgewater was a home of choice. But the way the district boundary has been done, a big significant part of the Edgewater community feeds into Johnson Park. And so the parents don't even come to us, they just go straight to uh, Wheatland L and where have you. And they're going from a very early age, like kindergarten. And so we do know we need that. So I will bring back, we have discussed as a board about a bond that there possibly should be some conversation. So I would like the board at the next board meeting to give me formal direction to start working on it. I think to your point, Mr. Criddle, we, we need to find a way to build more modern, more um, um, schools with more facilities and infrastructure so that the families that are buying new homes here are attracted to the facilities that we have to offer. And I think that's definitely a, a, a big, one of the big reasons. We have very aged infrastructure. Yeah, because we have the good programs. We're, we're, it's a work in progress kind of a thing, but I, I see this as more of an infrastructure issue of where are we going to put these kids? And yeah, we're, we're already busting at the seams. Um, but going back to my first analogy, at the end of the day, we're a business. That makes good business sense because we're losing customers, bottom line. Any other comments or questions from the board? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second by Allison Hasty. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Next, we have 19.2 approve the contract with Rock Eye Consulting LLC for a district wide safety vulnerability assessment. Do we have staff? Yes, I, I can speak to that. So, I uh, went out and reached out to uh, four different um, consulting firms to do a vulnerability assessment. This is a physical vulnerability safety assessment on each of our campuses. We have done those ourselves with local law enforcement, but we wanted to, especially with things that have happened this year, make sure that we were really taking a look and seeing everything that, that we need to be aware of. Uh, I do believe that you have a hard copy in front of you. There is just one change on that hard copy, and that is on the list of schools. Um, 
we have a whole bunch of schools with Lyndhurst in the name, and unfortunately I missed that Lyndhurst itself was not. So the terms and everything are exactly the same as it was posted. The only change there is that it lists Lyndhurst as well. But this will be a physical, they will be on site at every one of our campuses doing a full, and they specialize in this is what they do, former uh, law enforcement, special forces, those types of people um, to come in and do a full district-wide uh, vulnerability assessment for us. Well, I know we've had a lot of concern from the community about the safety of our campuses. And I know we have put in some, some measures that for the immediate, but there is a long-term need for, and since I've been on the board, this has never been done. So uh, it's very, very timely that we get on this. And so we don't waste money. I mean, this stuff is not cheap. And, and uh, working with technology, that stuff is not inexpensive. And it requires that whole technology group to move with it. And that, and then that goes back to an earlier discussion about the aging of some of our equipment. And some of the campuses are having to deal with that. So I, I, I think it's an absolute imperative that we do that. Are there any comments or questions for? I, just a quick question. I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but looking at the, the price tag of this, I'm trying not to because the safety of our kids, you, you can't put a price tag on that, but I'm looking at the term of the contract. This looks like 14 months. Why so long for a vulnerable, vulnerable a study? Vulnerable. Uh, they're not going to take a full 14 months to take a look at the campuses. A lot of that's going to be um, providing the information to us and helping work with us to come up with a plan on how to actually deal with some of the issues that are identified, and that's where part of that, that, that time is going to come from. And when you, you speak about the, the dollar amount, like I said, I reached out to four different consulting firms. I only got proposals back from two. This particular one was uh, more than $40,000 less than the other one that we got. Um, so it was, it was and, and this, is a, this is a particular firm that, that many other districts in the area and in the state have used for this exact purpose, and so they, they come very well respected. Would, do you think there would be possibly um, inter, intermediate or interim recommendations that we might be able to Absolutely. take up Absolutely. as it moves forward? Yes. Absolutely. Part of this will be to identify the, as what you know, as often referred to as low-hanging fruit um, that we can. But some of these, some of the things that we're expecting to get from this are going to be much longer-term things that we really have to plan and prepare for, and and so. That's the expectation. Are there any other comments or questions for technology? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved. Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second. Second by Gary Criddle. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7-0. Now we're at 20.1, Williams Act update for fiscal year 2022-23, presented by Yuba County Office of Education. I'm actually here tonight to present on behalf of Yuba County Office of Education. Good Thank evening. You. I am Amy Stratton, Director of Curriculum Assessment and Accountability. Um, welcome, uh, new board members. So every year, um, California Ed Code 1420 requires that the superintendent of schools or his designee to visit schools in Yuba County and report results of the visits to the board at a regularly scheduled board meeting. The annual report for fiscal year 22-23 is required by Ed Code Section 140-1240, Section C2AI, pursuant of Williams Settlement. So basically, we have one school in our district that requires a Williams visit, and that's Cedar Lane. And they get visited and evaluated on, um, is there enough materials for the students? and if the conditions of the school are in good repair. And Yuba County Office of Education has determined that all of our students had adequate, had, all of our students had curriculum, everything that they needed, as well as our facilities were in good repair. And that is the report that will go to the state of California. Are there any questions for me? I do have one question in regards sure. to providing context for me. 
Um, since I don't know, I'm new, could you explain to me why Cedar Lane is a uh, has a, a Williams site? Yeah. Yeah. So when the state of California was sued over conditions of schools and the fact that many of our schools, many of our children in the lowest of incomes actually did not have enough like things like textbooks. They had like a classroom set and they weren't allowed to take them home. And so there wasn't a, a lawsuit on, on uh, against the school districts, which resulted, it was called the Williams Act, which resulted in the lowest decile schools have a mandatory requirement of being visited and to, a, to check to make sure that all kids have curriculum in the core subjects and that the sites are in good repair. And so a certain percentage of the schools across the state of California are required to have these visits and that list of schools are presented and decided by the state of California. So just so that I understand, it has nothing to do with uh, MJUSD? And no, it, it has to do with the performance of the schools, the socioeconomic status, their EL numbers, their um, state test scores. Got There's it. a formula to it. Got it, okay. Yeah. So a follow-up question on that, Amy, would be, there's no way that Cedar Lane is going to get off this Williams site list? They will when their scores are to, at, at a point in which they're no longer low performing. Thank we you. used to, last year, I think we had five or six schools, and the reevaluation happened, and we're down to one school. Yeah. Thank you. Now we're at 20.2, complete the first read of the revised educator effectiveness block grant originally originally adopted on December 14, 2021. So I brought the revised educator effectiveness grant to the board back in September, and it was asked, the board asked if I consult with Muta to review it once again. And so I had a meeting with Muta, it was a very productive meeting, and we talked about, and I listened to the concerns, and so we went through, and I went through and revised, and I kept some of the stuff that the district um, saw a need to have in the grant, but I also kept quite a few of the items that Muta has also needed to see in the grant, and we just, I just kind of worked on the figures. And so this is the first read. It takes two board mem two meetings to approve it. So this is just the first read, the public input. So I'm just going to review and look at the, what's in there to what I am being, what I'm proposing. So currently, we had uh, we have instructional coaches at 800,000, and we are going to reduce that to 670,000 um, dollars. Okay. So the instructional coaching down to 670,000. And again, I, let me back up a little. This grant is good through the 25-26 school year. Um, and we have the entire grant amount is 2,303,000 roughly. So over the, from between now and the end of the 25-26 school year, reduce the instructional coaching by a little bit. I did remove the subs for training. We could provide all sub costs through Title II for professional development. Uh, we removed the um, reading intervention strategies. We're gonna use our instructional coaching for that as well as Title II. Uh, the UDL or RTI strategies, we're going to keep that in there. We are going to reduce it to 65000 We again have Title II programs. Just a quick reminder, I'm going to, should have inserted this ahead of time. When we're using our title programs, our title programs are the most restricted budget. Once we start using other funding sources for those title programs, we're no longer allowed to put those funding sources back into the title programs. So we have to be careful. I could pay for like the UDL training um, out, of the, out of the grant, but I also need to pay for part of it out of the title programs. I need to keep it still in the title programs. So we offset it by using our Title II program. Our PBL training, and we're also gonna set these up as trainer, um, training or trainer model which means we're gonna have a cadre of teachers that are going to receive intensive training, and they're, they're, those are gonna be the teachers that train our teachers. So again, that will help reduce some of the costs by bringing in trainers. We will use our staff for that. 
the AVID, again, um, we have other funding sources. We can make up the costs over the course of the next several years. Um, our pair of professional training for SPED, for special education, the special education department has funding sources for that. Uh, Trauma-informed restorative practices, again, we'll do the trainer of the training model through our SEL programs. Um, our GLAD training, we provide that by Title III, which is our EL funds. We've already done the GLAD training this year, and we paid for it through Title III. Um, provide training for our EL um, classroom paras, which, again, we could do those during the school day and provide it with our coordinator of ELD. And our um, administrative internship program, we did remove. Um, we are adding the TSIP program as well as the Teacher Pathways, which is our mentorship program. And there is our grant amount. And so we're just asking the board to approve the reallocation of these funds. Okay, and this is just the first read. There's no action tonight. Any, Any questions? questions for Amy? Angela, is this the program you were mentioning in your comments? Yes, Mr. Davis, it is. And what was your concern here? There are a few of them. Um, one being the fact that just on this last slide, the TSIP of $692,000, um, that will provide um, payment for the TSIP program for about 30 of our teachers. I think it's 30, 36, somewhere in that ballpark out of 508 teachers, and TSIP has been taken from LCAP, um, and so I'm not quite sure why TSIP would be coming out of the Educator Effectiveness Grant at this point. Um, and at that point in time, I mean, you're looking at about 30% of the grant going for TSIP just in and of itself. Um, 620,000 that you see here for the teacher pathways, um, Muto worked with um, Dr. Simon on a grant for that as well. And there again, you're looking at maybe somewhere in the ballpark of 25 teachers or so. Um, and that's another 26, 27% of the grant. And then when you look at the instructional coaching, um, although I appreciate the effort um, at and the thought of providing instructional coaches, um, for instance, one ELA coach um, for 508 teachers in the district um, is not particularly helpful, um, especially in contrast to the fact that we wanted somewhere in the ballpark of $150,000 um, to train the vast majority of our teachers in reading intervention strategies. Um, we had two literacy coaches here last year um, that we didn't even manage to get all of our elementary folks um, the reading strategy and literacy information and training that they wanted. And so certainly having one ELA coach is not going to be enough. Um, part of the other thing that I had discussed with the district representatives is the fact that when we originally sat down and looked at this, um, Muta did have some questions about spending such a large portion. They're getting about 29, 30% of the grant on the salaries for three individuals, although they are our unit members, um, but spending 30% of this grant on the salaries for three individuals um, over three years, we had some questions about and at the time, kind of the give and take and compromise between um, Muta and the district at that point was that we were able to keep the $400,000 in subs for trainings within this. Um, that has since now been removed. Um, so that presents another issue. And I understand and I hear full well the district telling me that they can use Title II monies for that. I've heard that for 26 years. And then right after that, I also hear that, but the district doesn't have any money to provide subs for you to have you know, training during your school day. And so you can either do it after school or not at all. And so that's where some of the issues lie. Um, yeah, the district can use a lot of different funding sources for certain things, but then they choose not to, especially once something like this has been approved. And so, like I said, it just brings up a lot of questions. And 
I have also said that I do appreciate the fact that originally, you know, we had $120,000 for both UDL and project-based learning, and then when this came up in October, there was zero for both of those, since $65,000 for each has been put back in. Um, I'm not exactly sure um, exactly what real training could be provided to my teachers on UDL and project-based learning um, to the tune of $65,000 for each of those over three years. Um, even doing a trainer of trainer models, which is exactly what we want. Amy's exactly right. We had that whole conversation. I had that conversation with um, Jay as well. Um, so again, I appreciate the fact that that input is being taken and that is being listened to. But I think also that the district would admittedly have to say that $65,000 for each of those over three years um, is, is going to be difficult at best. Um, so those are just some of the issues. Well, one of oh, the sorry. things that at least I would ask the superintendent with your staff to take a hard look at these issues. You know, it, it is to help the teachers. And, and, uh, and certainly it sounds like we could do better. And, and um, with these, these grant dollars, which Anyway, I would just ask the superintendent to review this with this input. I do, to mention, I do also want to mention that as the conversation continues to happen between the MUTA group and our district team, um, the priority of the teachers are always going to be in the forefront. We may not always agree on everything, but the grant approval doesn't mean this is written in stone. And I want to be very clear that we understand the board approves the plan, but the plan can shift a little bit here and there. So this is just to make sure that we are making a thoughtful decision on how the money is going to be used. Um, and also, I think um, uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised when Mr. Trujillo and his team bring forward the coaching plan. And it's not about hiring people anymore. It's about hiring site-based instructional leaders for additional assignments. I don't want to put the too much out there because I know that conversation is happening with you. So that will come to you. So you'll see that money is actually going to go to our teachers, not to three positions. So I, I believe that is input I was given. Am I correct in that? Yeah? Yes? OK. All right. So that's, that's just information today. Are there any other questions? President Davis, can I can I make can I um, get a clarification procedurally? So, so the agenda item was noted that it was to request the board to complete a first read, mm -hmm. and so uh, but the request was to actually approve the budget, right? Is that correct? This is the first read. The request to approve the budget will be at the next board meeting. Okay. Okay. Yep. I just want to make sure. So we're not going to motion to approve. It's just no. To... This is just a presentation. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're at 21.1, minimum wage increase and impact classification, classified employees. Dr. Simon. Yeah, so this is, um, we've got to go back. This is the um, impact of the state requirement to increase the minimum wage to $15.50, effective January 1, 2023. It only impacts one of our unrepresented groups and salary schedules. So we've made a 1% adjustment to every range, every cell of that salary schedule to fall within the state requirement. That's the only salary schedule we need um, to change as all the other schedules are compliant. Are there any questions for Dr. Simon? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second by Dr. Yang. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Now we're at 21.2. Approve the side letter of agreement between MJUSD and OE3 reclassification of bus drivers. Yeah, thank you. After a productive negotiations with Operating Engineers 3, which represent the majority of our classified staff. Um, we do uh, understand that busing is an essential service and we do need to attract more bus drivers um, and we feel an increase will help us in, in, to, in being able to do that as well as some other pipelines we're working with adult ed to, to work on for that, for that pipeline for drivers as well. Um, the, uh, 
the uh, accompanying AB 1200 required state documents for the cost out. Uh, it was provided by business services as well. Are there any questions for Dr. Simon? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Motion approved by Doug Criddle. Is there a second? Second by Gary Criddle. Oh, Franks, thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Now we're at 21.3. Approve the side letter agreement between MJUSD and OE3, incorporating outreach consultants into the clerical unit. Yes, outreach consultants were previously unrepresented. Um, the um, OE3 petitioned to have them join their union. The majority of outreach consultants, um, by the required margin, um, agreed to do that. Um, it made m the most sense to um, place them on the existing ranges on the salary schedule versus compacting the entire schedule, which would have been a, a much larger um, cost. So we placed them on existing range 29, which gives them a slight increase over their current compensation. Are there any questions for the board? Are there any questions? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Motion approved by Doug Criddle. Is there a second? My name is Second Criddle. Sorry. Right. Gary Criddle seconded. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7 0. Now we're at 21. Point four, approve the tentative agreement between MJUSD and CSEA number 326 and corresponding job description. Yes, thank you. This is um, the chapter of CSEA that represents our paraeducators and those classifications. Um, we have a need in our um, district to Deli further delineate the duties of the child development, bilingual, special education, and personal aid paraeducators. Um, we have some unique student needs in regards to, to self-help skills, toileting, et cetera. The, all those job descriptions have been updated. Uh, one is a new one, child development paraeducators. We have a salary that we feel represents those duties, and we now are in line with other districts that offer increased compensation for more intense paraeducator positions. So this is a great move for our district to be competitive in hiring these folks. The question I have is, how does this work with our budget? Is this, are we staying within what we know of our budget? Yeah, so we did consult business services and look at the short and long-term um, cost out of this um, increase. It is well within the budget. It's considered a reclassification, so it doesn't involve any additional compensation to other groups. Um, we definitely increase the responsibilities of these paraeducators and feel that um, now that those duties are well documented, um, the increase um, not only makes us competitive, but uh, represents or aligns with what we're asking them to do. Are there any questions, Dr. Simon? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion, approved. motion approved by Allison Hasty. Is there a second? Second by Gary Criddle. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Now we're at 22.1 resolution 2022 23 17 to amend the 403B retirement plan with Omni Health. Thank you. Our Omni Financial Group is our third party. Uh, advisor for our 403B program, and this year they've amended their plan detail, and it requires a board resolution, and the and staff asks that you approve. Are there any questions for Jennifer? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved. Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second by Allison Hasty. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Now we're at 22.2. Approve the resolution 2022 23 18, authorizing 2022 Urban Community Drought Relief Grant Program application acceptance 
and execution for the replacement of athletic fields district-wide. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board, new board members, Dr. Azrani and Cabinet. Um, I'm up here to give you a little background on this uh, grant, and our goal is to improve our athletic turfs first for our um, high schools and intermediate schools, and then look at um, the other fields that we have around the district uh, that are in need of improvement for irrigation and turf. Um, this grant is for a minimum of $3 million, and it, it does not include artificial turf. Are, are there any questions for Doug? The money will not pay for artificial turf? Will not. So what is it going to be, real grass? Yeah, it'll, it'll be um, a native drought-resistant turf, real grass, or plant. Fascinating. You're going to like it. You're going to like it. I know that's, is, is that similar to what we have at Lenhurst? Correct. If any of you have been out there, you'll see it's, and it's incredible. Yeah. Are, there, are there any questions for Doug? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved by Frank Crawford. Is there a second? Second by Allison Asty. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Thank you, Doug. Now we have 22.3 approved the agreement with PBK Architects for Foothill Intermediate School Modernization. And there is a correction in the proposal. Uh, it, it really is a, just a typo. Uh, Jennifer? Sure. It's a correction in the agenda background. Um, the proposal and the agreement attached are correct. But um, the correction is uh, the second sentence in the background agenda item. The traditional OPSC fee schedule for modernization calculates this budget for a fee rate of 10.64%. And then it goes on to read that PBK is offering a reduced fee rate of 8%. And so, so it is a savings. Yes. Are there any questions for either Doug or Jennifer? If not, do I hear a motion? Motion approved. approved by Doug Criddle. Do I have a second? Second by Frank Crawford. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 7 0. Passes. Now we're at 22.4 proposed. Proposal with Lloyd Sports and Engineering for the Marisville High High School Track Project. Doug? Um, Jennifer? You sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So this item is to approve the agreement with the architects that we chose. Um, we interviewed and we ranked three architectural firms and Lloyd Engineering was our pick and this is the agreement. Um, to for them to design the track and we asked the board to approve the agreement Do we have a timeline? We do have a timeline once this contract is approved design phase starts and that runs from about January to April It'll get submitted to DSA um, That's usually about a 12 to 14 week process and we're hoping to start um, The project will have to go out to bid, but we're hoping mid to late summer and it's a nine to 12 month construction process. So do we think we would get it finished for the new school year or not? It, it, uh, we're, no, not, not in time for the school year, but hopefully for the end of the school year of the 23-24. Okay. okay. Yes. Are there any questions? So what are the students going to be using if they don't have their track available? We'll have to work that out with the school and, and come up with some other arrangements. Options? Yes, okay. absolutely, yes. Are there any other questions for either Jennifer or Doug? Yeah, um, is, this, is this solely for the retrofitting the track in addition to the field or? So yeah, no, this will be the track and field upgraded including lights as well. Doug, does that have bleachers? Was there bleachers still involved in that? There's minimum bleachers, yeah. Okay, and how about uh, pathway access for outside or? That'll all be included. Um, ADA, that, those would be ADA requirements. Okay, thank you. 
I was just going to add that once the design is completed and it'll go to DSA, and DSA is the Department of State Architecture, for the, and they oversee any facility project with the, any school districts, and so they will ensure that we have ADA compliance, path of travel, and everything that is required for a safe facility environment for our students. Any other questions? So before we get phone calls from angry parents, I just want to point out on the very bottom, the agreement for architectural service for the Lindhurst High School project is next. Is PBK also going to be doing this one? Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirtle. Yes. No, this is Lloyd Sports and Engineering, not PBK. And oh. yes, they are excited to help us out with the Lindhurst, and that will come in January. We just had our community meeting with Lindhurst last week, and it was great. We had a good turnout with our students, staff parents and community members. So we got feedback just like we did with the Marysville community and so we will bring that to you in January. Okay, I know they're two completely different sites but can we kind of expect to have the same um, infrastructure and, and relatively cost to be as, about the same between the two schools? Well they're Walter? completely two different facilities yeah. and so we are going to scope this out and ha then we'll come back with the agreement and then start that design phase and that will include um, input from community members, students, and staff also during the design phase, because they have a football field in there also, and they have bleacher they do. and other, they have other items that they need different from the Marysville High School track. Do you think that the price would end up being more? And this is just speculation. I have, I have no idea, saying. but we have budgeted yeah. five million for each. Is that okay. correct, Dr. Osrani? So, I, yes. I, I just want to so. be clear on, on making sure that both schools get exactly what they need, and it's not a, a, a contest of dollars per se, it's, we're, we're giving them what they need and what their site can handle. Absolutely, we want it to be just, equitable. Just a clarification, uh, need is here, want is here, <laughs> so we just need to be very realistic about what we can do, and so, but we will not compromise one site over the other, I think that's a statement. Right. So, yeah, so the, the goal will be to provide all the necessities for them to operate both tracks um, if we need to do some type of value, value engineering or um, or next phase process on that, we'll, we'll look into that. Any other questions or discussion? If not, do I hear a motion? It was approved by Frank Crawford. Second. Second. <laughs> by Allison Hasty. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7-0. Thank you. Now we have the last item on the agenda, approve the 2022-23 first interim financial report. Jennifer? Good evening, thank you. You'll see my presentation here in just a moment. But I just, as a reminder, want to um, emphasize that it is an overview of the big packet that was included loosely in your board packet for our first interim financial report. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Basrani, Cabinet, and the MJUSD community. Tonight, I will present the 2022-23 First Interim Budget. This budget update provides a picture of the district's financial condition from July 1st through October 31st and projects financial activity through June 30th, 2022. In this presentation, I will go over the budget cycle, give a budget update on our unrestricted and restricted general funds, along with an update of our COVID relief funds and one-time block grants, general fund summary, multi-year projections, and next steps. This is a diagram of our LCAP budget cycle. We are constantly working in a three-year cycle. It begins in July with the adopted budget of the 22-23 fiscal year. In September, we had closed our books for the 21-22 fiscal year and bring to you our unaudited actuals. Here we are now in December with the 22-23 first interim financial update. In January, we will hear from the governor on his 23-24 fiscal year budget proposal. And then in March, we'll come back with the 22-23 second interim financial report. And then April through May, we'll begin working on our preliminary LCAP and budget. In May, the governor will come out with his revise to his budget proposal for the 23-24 fiscal year. And then in June, we'll present to you the proposed adopted budget and LCAP for your approval for the 23-24 fiscal year.
I'll begin with an overview of changes from adopted budget to the first interim of our unrestricted general fund. The unrestricted general fund is for the general operation of the school district. First interim compared to adopted budget reflects an increase of revenue of $6.4 million. $6.2 million of the increase is due to the COLA of 6.7% that increased from the enacted state budget. We also had a slight increase in local revenue due to a CalSTRS excess calculation and interest earned. The net increase of unrestricted general fund expenditures is $1.4 million. The $1.4 million net increase to expenditures is due to unrestricted site discretionary carryover, the alignment of salary and benefits, 21-22 negotiated salary inc increase for the CSEA bargaining units, an increase to routine restricted maintenance to meet the required 3% maintenance of effort, realignment of the indirect costs from restricted programs. This next set section will compare the restricted side of the general fund from first interim to adopted budget. Restricted funds come from other state revenue and federal revenue and are available for use only within the program and purposes for which they are granted. The restricted general fund revenue has increased by 74.5 million since the adopted budget. Of the $74.5 million increase, federal revenue increased by 42.7 million due to 21-22 carryover. These funds include COVID relief, our ESSER II, ESSER III, and ELO grants, and other federal funds such as our title funding. We also had an increase in our other state revenue of 30.8 million for our learning recovery emergency grant and expanded learning opportunities program. And then we also had 21-22 carryover for our programs such as inclusive early education, CTIG, special education, K-12 strong workforce. And we had a slight increase in local revenue for our Medi-Cal billing of a half a million dollars. Restricted general fund expenditures increased by 32 million. This $32 million increase is due to the 21-22 carryover budgeted for expenditures that include salary and benefits for extra duty for both certificated and classified employees, materials and supplies, services and other operating expenses for programs such as expanded learning, opportunities program title funds, and COVID relief funds. 11.6 million is allocated to the Covalod 16 classroom building from our ESSER II, and we had a transfer of outgo to our MCAA of their ESSER funds and title funds. This is an overview of the remaining COVID relief funds. The ESSER II funds must be spent by June 2023. The ESSER III and ELO grants have a spending deadline of June 2024. The following slide summarizes the expenditures allocated to the COVID relief funds. This recap of COVID relief expenditures is summarized by funding source ESSER II Covalod Classroom Building. ESSER III has been allocated for increased learning support and the Foothill Modernization Project and the ELO grants for learning support. A deeper dive into the COVID relief funds reflects positions that have been added to increase support to our students and staff. Additional one-time funding sources that have occurred since the adopted budget are the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant and the Arts, Music, and Instructional Discretionary Block Grant. The Learning Recovery Grant of $15.8 million has a spending deadline of September 30th, 2028. Although a spending plan is not required, a reporting of ex expenditures is, and spending is restricted to allowable uses such as pupil supports, instruction for credit deficit students, increase or stabilize instruction learning time, and closing gaps. The Art and Music's discretionary grant does require a plan and has a spending deadline of June 30th, 2026. The allowable uses for this grant are standards aligned professional development and instructional materials, diverse book collections, operational costs, and pandemic-related supplies. 
Next is a summary of the total general fund. This summary reflects unrestricted, restricted, and combined totals for the general fund. The total revenues minus the expenditures less other uses equals a net increase to the fund balance of $31.9 million. This added to the beginning balance of 60.6 .6 million totals a $92.5 million ending fund balance. The components of this $92.5 million ending fund balance are revolving cash and estimated ending inventory, 654,000, restricted use, 57.9 million, committed for our facilities and technology, 11 million, assignments, 17.3 million, economic uncertainty, 5.7 million, for a total fund balance of 92.5 million. Multi-year projections included include the first current first multi-year projections include the current fiscal year budget and budget projections for the two subsequent years. This is a planning tool that considers current and projected planning factors. This multi-year projection is a summary of the unrestricted general fund. You can find more detail on the multi-year in your first interim budget packet. This is a table of the planning factors considered when projecting this current year budget and our out years. We use the Department of Finance statutory COLA along with any local control funding COLA, projected STRS and PERS employer rates, and Universal Transitional Kindergarten ADA. We also use a 2% step in column increase for our each year for our added salary and benefit costs. Coming up next will be our LCAP and budget meetings. In January, we'll, be back, we'll hear what the governor budget proposal has to say for the 23-24 fiscal year. Capital advisors will be here in February to give us an update. And in March, we'll present to you the 22-23 second interim financial reports. I would like to give a huge thank you to Cindy Helms, the director of fiscal and her entire team for all their hard work preparing our financials. And I'd also like to thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Jennifer. That's a lot of rows and columns. <laughs> the, have we heard any update? I, I know we, you know, when we were at CSBA, the number was 28 million billion in shortfall for the state. Have they updated that number? They have. I believe it's around 42 billion, 48, and um, but they. We just received a, a message from Capital Advisors, I think today or yesterday, and I apologize, I don't have all that information in front of me, but yes, they have updated that number. Yes. So do we, have you heard any strategies for how they're going to cover that uh, with, with the new year um, um, funding? With, with for next year, for the 23-24 yes, yes. year. I, I believe what I'm hearing is that we're okay for the next year. We have enough in reserves, the Calif California state does. It'll be those out years that they'll have, we'll have to start looking at how they're going to adjust for that. Um, education money is protected by Prop 98. And um, so we'll have to wait and see what the governor comes out with in January. Are there any other questions from the board or comments? Yeah, um I'm just asking a series of stupid questions all night because I'm the okay. new guy. The, the, uh, um, I just want to understand what does it mean in the recommended action when it says positive certification, okay. even though we're um, actually showing deficit spending? Right. Yes. Well, okay. we're, yes, it does show we're deficit spending, but by a positive certification, we're certifying that we ha do have enough in our reserves um, to cover those expenditures in the, out in the two out years from the current year. Frank Crawford has made a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Doug Credle. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7 0. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. We have no public comments that came in at, on time, and therefore the meeting is adjourned.
Yubasutter.live's local government live streams are presented by Plumas Lake Self Storage in Plumas Lake, where lifelong local residents are helping other residents keep things safe, providing indoor storage units, outdoor RV and vehicle parking, moving supplies, and Penske truck rentals. Details at PlumasLakeSelfStorage.com. Skip's Marysville Music Cafe, with lessons in person and personalized. Instruments, including guitars and amps, horns, strings, strings for instruments, and a myriad of music and sound equipment. Skip's Marysville Music Cafe. <laughs> 